Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming um, to an evening with one of our favorite, all-time favorite speakers, Dr. Stanley Krippner, in honor of the 65th anniversary of the Parapsychology Foundation. And before I turn it over um, to Lisa Coley to do Dr. Krippner's um, intro, uh, we had the opportunity to interview Stanley uh, two days ago. Our filmmaker in residence um, documented some stories on video that Stanley shared. And he put together a three minute clip of Dr. Krippner talking about his own dreams. So it, in, in the spirit of the event, we were, he, put, he put it together really fast for us to be able to view today. So I'm going to show that. And Letty, can you, do, yeah, with lights. And so we'll look at that first. And so now we'll have Lisette Coley, the president of the Parapsychology Foundation, do Dr. Krippner's intro. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. It gives me great pleasure uh, to greet you all this evening uh, on a moment that is, for me personally, very uh, important, and also for Parapsychology Foundation, since this is a milestone uh, in serving, uh, a milestone for our organization. I've been serving as the third president of Parapsychology Foundation, following our founder, Eileen J. Garrett, my maternal grandmother, and my mother, the late Eileen Coley. I stand before you somewhat astounded and enormously proud that PF, as we are commonly referred to, will celebrate in December our 65th year of activities. Before I toot the PF's horn too loudly, I want to, along with our board of trustees, thank the administration of the Morbid Anatomy Museum for generously allowing us to co-sponsor what for us is a very special lecture. Our gratitude extends to co-founder and creative director Joanna Ebenstein, head librarian and event coordinator Leticia Barbier, administrator Christina Preda, and to my special friend Shannon Taggart, uh, the programmer and artist in residence, along with filmmaker in residence Ronnie Thomas. Now rest assured, I am not going to attempt to bore you with a summary of our 65 years of activities but uh, of our various programs, which do consist of an international conferences, publishing, grants and awards, a prospective lecture series, and maintenance of the Garrett Research Library with over 12,000 volumes, periodicals culled from around the world, and an archive, of, an AV archive. But I would like to read to you a statement from Eileen Garrett something explaining in her own words uh, her vision for a foundation that she conceptualized and brought to life in December of 1951. In her autobiography, Many Voices, uh, published in 1968, before her death in 1970, she wrote, one day I had an auditory experience that brought into focus my plans for setting up a research foundation. On the periphery of sleep, I heard a voice telling me I must get well and build an edifice that would honor the subject to which I had devoted my life. I awoke with a feeling of, in the dark, a feeling of deep uh, conviction that I must begin to build a new structure containing the best elements of my own work. After a few days thought, plans evolved for a periodic conference to be held within a university that would consist of parapsychology students of all ages and for a research foundation that would help scholars explore new fields, as well as introduce young people to the vast body of literature now stored away in the rooms of the various psychic research offices. Much of this literature was valuable and needed to be made accessible to a new generation to whom the field of psychical research had not been evident. Finally, the plans for a conference took clear shape. I also outlined a foundation devoted to educational pursuits which might hope to, which hope to accomplish, most of all, to bring to the attention of distinguished scholars a subject that one day must compel their attention and that of the world if man were to understand some of the deeper motivations of his own being. During my years of research, I had found that there were scholars in a number of countries engaged in pathfinding work 
though many of them were isolated from their colleagues in other lands. They were all equally eager to advance beyond dogmatic orthodoxy into techniques that were already being revealed to them by the extraordinary mechanisms which were already being revealed. I know my work then was falling into three distinct areas. First, I envisioned the necessity of finding resources that could provide grants to those who sought after a wider horizon in reading. Second, this would involve a library and a public relations setup to answer the demands for literature and the eventual study for those who might be ready to work in a parapsychological atmosphere. Finally, there would be the need to bring scholars together from different countries for discussion, as well as the need to keep contacts alive if the eventual advancement of the theoretical discussion were to result in action. These were the goals then to be reached if I could take psychical research out of the field of the abnormal, eccentric, or unreal and bring together those who understood the deep unconscious forces at work that lead people to work with mediums. Following the actual birth of the organization, Garrett stated, the PF does not endorse any specific technique of study or research that encourages activities in areas, but, but rather encourages activities in areas that would appeal, appear to other possibilities of serious scientific achievement within our area of inquiry. To be accepted in the world of science, parapsychology must remain flexible, free to study and experiment in the uncharted and interior regions of man's mind, it must never lose the receptivity to ideas and methods that now contribute to the unique and challenging position in modern scientific thought. Well, I'm personally confident, as uh, one of the stewards of the organization she established, that PF has continued, and with your help, perhaps, can continue to support man's inquiry into the mysteries of his inner resources. Times have changed, of course, with greater communications through the internet and social media. Some of our tasks have lessened, but there is still so much to be done to get to the answers to questions raised by psychic functioning. We continue to search for the solutions to these universal questions that elude humankind, which together we, as students of the paranormal of all stripe, can hope to unravel. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Stanley Krippner, has been busy unraveling various mysteries and is uniquely positioned to get to those answers we all long for. He has spent his career as a researcher, experimentalist, <laughs> author, and teacher who draws from a myriad of resources to help make sense of the psychic world around us. He has not only weathered the whirlwind that was Eileen Garrett, and, but has provided counsel and friendship to, his, to her daughter and granddaughter as we all seek to continue the good works of the PF. I am so grateful that as well he will be of no doubt of similar support to my daughter, Anastasia Demalis, who is as the fourth generation of women in my family working within the PF, and is, as she is presently serving her apprenticeship in much the same way as my mother and I did following Garrett's lead. His CV is far too long to present at this time. Suffice to say that the fields of psychology, parapsychology, anthropology, sociology, and many other ologies um, share our debt to him on, as he travels the world at this point in his prolific career, shedding light on oft times misunderstood and complex phenomena as a sort of roving ambassador. Always of inestimable value and assistance to students and researchers, so many people can't help but respect, revere, and love Stanley Krippner. Those at Parapsychology Foundation, which include my family, and all our colleagues and associates owe him a great debt, and it's totally appropriate that he has graciously agreed to present this PF's milestone lecture. So with enormous love and gratitude, I give to you Dr. Stanley Krippner speaking to dreams from another dimension. Well, thank you very much, Lisette, and welcome to all of you who came. When it started to rain, I thought, well, there goes our audience. But not only did the rain stop, we had a beautiful rainbow, if you notice. And so uh, that was a very welcome sign for our little soiree here this evening. Now, usually when I come, I bring some books. I couldn't this time because I'm coming here from Denver, 
but I'm going to plug a book. So why don't you pass out those little cards because there's a tie into this book on Eileen Garrett. A friend of mine, an internet friend, has just written a book about how the mystery of Amelia Earhart's disappearance has been solved. Many of you are too young to know who Amelia Earhart was, but back in the 1930s she was the most famous woman in the world. Or you might have seen the movie version of Amelia Earhart that came out about five years ago. She was a female aviator who flew around the world for her last voyage and disappeared over the Pacific. And the official word was that she and her co-pilot had been um, lost, ran out of gas, and went down to the Pacific. But the book, The Mystery of Amelia Earhart, solved takes a different point of view, and this is the Eileen Garrett time in, because Eileen Garrett did a reading, and she came up with some ideas that were never published. And Lissette is going to do some research and see if she can find those files. Very strange that these are never published, but there might be a tie-in on why the real disappearance of Amelia Earhart was never announced, because, to give you a little summary of the book, no, she and her co-pilot didn't die, they crashed. But they crashed on an island close to a Japanese fortified island. And they actually died in a Japanese prison camp. And there are witnesses who remember that. They've been telling their stories before, but their stories were never heard. Why was this not publicized? Why was this hidden by the US government because the popular uprising would have been so ferocious that the United States would have gotten into war with Japan back in the 1930s. And that was too early. America was not prepared for war with Japan. They weren't even Japan prepared in 1941 of the Japanese bomb for Pearl Harbor. So poor Amelia Earhart was a victim of international politics in the days of the rise of Japanese power. Anyway, that's a little summary of the book, and if you don't want to get the book yourself, pass on the card to somebody else, and maybe someday we'll find out what Eileen Garrett's take on all of this was, now that uh, we have a plausible hypothesis on what really happened to Amelia Earhart and her co-pilot. And again, those of you who have never heard of Amelia Earhart, do her history, look up the story on Wikipedia, and you will realize what a remarkable woman she was and how she really was a champion of uh, women's adventurous spirit and resilience back in the days when women were not supposed to do things like flying airplanes. Well, my presentation tonight takes on a topic that's closely associated with the work of the Parapsychology Foundation, which is why I thought it'd be of interest on the 65th anniversary of this wonderful organization with which I've been associated with so many years. And I'm calling it Dreams from Another Dimension, question mark. And during the presentation, you will see why the question mark goes there. So, out of the blue, I, a few years ago, I got an email from a woman who works as a program coordinator with the US Armed Forces in an unspecified state, because I'm keeping her identity secret for reasons which become obvious. And we began a correspondence. She contacted me for three reasons. Because of my interest in unusual dreams, because of my knowledge of the US military, because of my work on my two books on post-traumatic stress disorder, and because of my interest in survival of the personality after death. OK. So that's why she came to me. And I did, I've been doing my best to honor that contact. And so here is the story. I'm using the name Amanda Fisher. She's an events planner for the US Army, coordinating events for relationship-enriched programs, such as retreats for both married and unmarried soldiers. In addition, she worked with Army chaplains. Her father was an ordained minister, and she attended Protestant worship services, most of them down in, among the Mishnah in her youth. As a child, she recalled several dreams that were related to religious themes, as well as dreams that appeared to forecast future events, and lucid dreams in which she realized she was dreaming. 
In addition, Amanda had a few dreams about deceased family members. In one of them, her grandmother of Native American descent told her that she understood why Amanda could not be present when she passed. Now, these are all precursors that are familiar with us in the field of somebody who might develop what we call mediumship capacities, the ability to communicate with purported folks in the spirit world. Eileen Garrett had a number of those experiences. You read her autobiography, you found as a child in Ireland, she had many of these same experiences. So in the course of her work with the US Army, Amanda met Wink, again another pseudonym, who had been a chaplain's assistant for several years. And he, of course, was a member of the US Army. After six months after assisting Army chaplains, Amanda began having unusual dreams and started telling them to Wink. She did not tell Wink all of her dreams, only those involving what she called a definite compulsion to share them with her co-worker. These dreams specific had contained specific names and other information could be verified or falsified. Amanda contacted me in early 2015 and has given me written permission to use her dream reports in my ongoing research concerning anomalous dreams, including the work that some of you heard me talk about when I worked for 10 years here in Brooklyn at Maimonides Medical Center at the Dream Laboratory. Our correspondence has been by email and all the names in this report are fictitious. Several other measures have been taken to preserve anonymity. I conduct the Skype interview with Wink early in 2016, which verified the information given me by Amanda. So Amanda wrote me that her first anomalous dream in the series occurred about six months after she met Wink, who was a Native American from Arizona. His clan has an unusual language, very different than the Navajo language spoken by his father. Wink, who, as he put it, was raised as a warrior, was told by his elders that he had been given the gift of discernment. Recently, he held a conversation with tribal elders in which he told them about Amanda's dreams. They replied that her ability was the complimentary gift to his. Wink had just begun to tell her about his military career and his overseas service when she had her first dream of the series. Now, actually, there's a total of 10 dreams in the series. And it would really take hours to go into all 10 of the dreams, so I'm just going to tell you about a few of them tonight. This is dream one. I'm walking across the road to see a friend's new house. Before I can return to my house, I have to go through a building. I'm in an American Legion building where I start playing bridge with two ladies. One lady is in her late 50s and the other is in my, another is her mother, about 80. I tell them I'm from Kentucky and then the daughter remarks that her mother collects business cards from the record store she visits in Louisville. She hands me a stack of cards. In the middle is a lanyard with the name Sanchez on it. I recall that of all the special operations personnel, personnel have to wear identification lanyards while they're in their com compound. In my dream, I call Wink so that he can see what is in my hand. He says, I'll be right there. I look at the other side of the lanyard. You know, a lanyard is like a necklace in the military. And there is a picture of a rattlesnake with a knife through its tail. Wink then comes into the building, hugs the two ladies, and walks off with them. Then I wake up. The next morning, I call Wink on his way to work and tell him a little bit about my dream. He came right over to my house. He told me that one of his friends, Jeremy Sanchez, was killed in 2004. The only surviving members of his immediate family were his mother and grandmother. Before Jeremy was killed, he was auditioning for a spot in a special operations unit. The symbol of that unit he wanted to be in was a rattlesnake with a sword in its tail. Okay, so you take the story about the real life Sanchez, who was killed in uh, Afghanistan, compare it to the dream, and it checks out. The two women check out, and the symbol of the rattlesnake with the knife in his tail check out, and the exact name checks out. See, several correspondences which makes this what we call in the field evidential. Now here's case two. In this dream, I'm arguing with Wink about the location of a venue for a special event. Then I go walking down a hallway in a property where I've coordinated events in the past. 
I go into a large suite where a couple of sleeping rooms share a common parlor area. As I walk into the parlor, a man is sitting on a sofa. I sit down and start talking to him about the nature of his work. I also want to share with him my connection with the special operations, aviation world, and with Wink. He hands me a manila folder, and I see a name on the site. It is Bandrews. When I told Wink about this dream, he told me that a pilot friend of his had died on a mission. It was the first time that a manifest had been done in a way that would add the first two letters of the first name on the soldier's last name. Britt Andrews was the pilot on that mission. But through the manifest change, he was this is Bandrews. The manifest should have read Brandrews, but someone had made a mistake. So here again, we have very, very specific information with a very specific name and a very unusual name because of the way that the first letter, actually the first two letters, were combined with the last name. Somebody made a mistake making it Bandrews instead of Brandrews, and Bandrews is the name that appeared in Amanda's dream. So remember back to what the tribal elders told Wink, that he had the gift of discernment and that his gift was complementary to Amanda's. So again, if all of these people are telling the actual truth, it's like a teamwork going on, where it's Amanda who's having the dream about the deceased soldiers who Wink knew, and then Wink is verifying them once Amanda tells the story. Here's case three. This dream included several people. I hear a missile siren and dive into a nearby building. It's like an old college dormitory filled with young men. I realize it's a fraternity. I look in one room and a bunch of guys are together playing video games and talking. I ask for someone and they tell me his room is next door. I knock on his door and my roommate says that he is in the gymnasium. I walk into the gym and see if a group of guys standing at a desk at one end of the open gym. I ask if I can toss the football around with them and we make small talk. One guy says his name is Larry. Another introduces himself as Adam. And then I say, I'm looking for Patrick. They say, he's over there. And I see a guy sitting with a girl on his lap. I say, hello but tell them that he is not the Patrick I was looking for. Okay, puzzling information in the dream, some specific names. When I told Wink about the dream, I mentioned that it had a Larry and Adam and two Patricks in it. Wink was disconcerted. He told me that all of those names were the same as members of the group of rangers he knew. Larry and Adam were both killed in improvised explosive device attacks. Wink had to bring Larry to the hospital in two pieces. The two Patricks grew up in the Ranger Regiment together. The first Patrick went into battle and was shot. The second Patrick ran to save him and was carrying help when he was fatally shot. The first Patrick died of blood loss. Wink said that the first Patrick was his roommate in Ranger School and that Patrick had pictures of him and his fiancée around the bed. Wink remembered that in every picture, Patrick's fiancée was sitting on his lap. So there you are. Again, if they're telling the truth, if the dream is true, if the response by Wink is true, very specific verification between the dream and Wink's real life waking experience, tragic though it may be. Case four. Wink and I are upstairs standing in my bedroom. We're having a conversation about a new end table. He keeps trying to open the blinds but I tell him not to because I do not like people being able to see into my room. But then he looks down and sees someone whom he starts helping up the wall and into the window. Wink looks at me puzzled because he's surprised that he is seeing a man he knows is deceased. But they start talking about random things and the man sits on the floor of my bedroom. A woman comes in and sits down and two kids start climbing on him. He says it's time for him to go. Wink looks at him and asks me in on the side if I see the scars on his face. I haven't really mentioned them. Then I see scars on the right side of his face, a big one on it by his eye, and smaller ones on his mouth and cheek. We then start walking down the stairs with him. He starts complaining that his right hip is hurting, and I give him support as we're walking and reassurance that he will be home soon. 
I sit him in an old chair at what would be the front door of my house. As he sits down, I take Wink by the hand and tell him that we need to leave him. When I spoke with Wink about the details of the dream, he says it sounds like Evan Green, a Navy SEAL he was very close to. The SEAL, in fact, did have two children. His right eye was a glass eye, and there were scars on the right side of his face from catching shrapnel. The fight he ultimately died in was in a mountainous region of Afghanistan when he climbed up a wall and sat as a decoy so that the rest of the team could take over the building. He was shot 17 times. As for the front door of our house, Wink and I had blessed that door with sage, so it would be the only entrance through which spirits are supposed to enter. So, those are four of the ten dreams. And to get the whole story, you have to buy the Journal of Near-Death Experience. The current issue has the full story in it. These dreams are usually about deceased persons whom Wink knew, most of them soldiers with whom he had served. He himself was actually of almost all of the battles in which they died. I never see anything bloody or violent, though. The dreams take place in a casual setting. I've learned that the dreams with specific names and details that I remember after waking are the ones I should relay to Wink. Despite the brutal and violent ways in which these soldiers died, they always appear perfectly healthy in my dreams and good spirits. I feel that they're trying to reach out to Wink to tell them that they are fine and not in the condition in which he last saw them. Perhaps his guilt and overwhelming feelings cloud his abilities to have these dreams himself, and so they come through me. One possibility. Explanations other than after-death communication would include fraud, faulty memory and coincidence. To rule out fraud, one would need to interview Wink to be sure that the dreams as recorded by Ananda were identical to the dreams related to Wink. Even so, if there had been collusion, one could not easily determine if Ananda and Wink had concocted the dreams to fit the circumstances of the demise of Wink's buddies. The fraud hypothesis needs to be considered. However, the scenario is extremely convoluted. It would have been simpler for Amanda to make up the dreams without bringing in another person, one who, upon questioning, might admit complicity. Also, among, must also question the motivation. Dreaming about deceased persons is not the easiest way to garner attention in the contemporary United States. <laughs> Furthermore, Amanda has made no attempt to use these dreams for commercial gain or publicity purposes. Finally, if Wick is engaging in fraud, there would be serious repercussions to his military career should his integrity be questioned. Now let's just consider this possibility for a few minutes. Yes, if Amanda and Wink were in collusion, it would be simply, to, simply just to make up the dreams and pass them on to me in an attempt to discredit the field of parapsychology well, the article is now published, so where is the expose? It hasn't happened, at least not yet. Or if Amanda is innocent, but if Wink is playing the trick, you see, Wink could be inventing people and could be uh, inventing people that corresponded to Amanda's dreams. If so, this would put him at serious risk because he is a member of the US military. And to make up a story like this, once his identity is connected with the article, which a probing investigator could easily do, he would be out of a job. And so this would be, he would be taking a great risk, a much greater risk than Amanda, in terms of perpetuating a fraud. Now, fraud is still possible. You know, I've been in this field a long time, and Lissette and I have both seen a lot of fraudulent mediums, a lot of fraudulent, fraudulent claims come and go. So that's why we have to spend so much time on this possibility. Amanda and Wink were going to meet me at a meeting of uh, the near-death people in Virginia last year, and they couldn't make it before I left. However, they did make it. And they did meet with some of the people I know in the audience, and they revealed their true identity. So they're on record, they're real people. And some of my colleagues did talk with them. 
So they're not concocted people. Two people actually showed up who introduced themselves as Wink and Amanda under their real names, of course. And so again, if fraud has been committed, they're at great risk for losing their jobs because they can be easily found out and identified, especially from their appearance uh, in the, at, at the convention last year. Another alternative is faulty memory. People's dreams report never capture agreements entirely. Could Amanda have started to tell Wink the dream only to have interviewed him interviewed us? Could this have been my buddy Hal? Amanda could have then moved, yes, I believe his name was Hal or Howard. Over time, the conversation might have been forgotten, and the dream report that was shared with me could have left out its evolution. Although this scenario is possible, it seemed highly unlikely that this pattern would repeat itself several times without either Amanda or Wink becoming aware of it. Now, among these fraudulent mediums, we have a pattern known as cold reading, where the fraudulent medium will listen carefully to the person who comes to him or to her and will draw out information and then will repeat that information back in a very, very clever way. So even though the medium has no abilities whatsoever in terms of psychic abilities, the medium does have a gift for soliciting information and weaving them into a scenario that would later be fed back to the client, thinking the client uh, would come back, so oh, yes, I had a conversation with my dead mother and all the details checked out. And if you had a transcript, you could see how clever the medium was in terms of uh, drawing out the information and then feeding it back. That, of course, is all too common in this field. The third possibility is telepathy or some other form of super side. Amanda could have obtained information about the deceased soldiers through some type of remote perception and attributed this information to her connection with Wink. The argument against this suggestion rests on the specific details in Amanda's dreams, or before of which had been included in this presentation. Now, in terms of super side, or telepathy, or clairvoyance, remote perception. This is an explanation that's often put forward by very serious parapsychologists, that information that one gets from mediums about the deceased uh, could be some form of telepathy, or clairvoyance, or some other extrasensory ability. However, in real life, in the laboratory, you simply do not get such detail in telepathy tests as we have in these dreams, with very, very specific people and very specific identification names. So this goes beyond what we would ordinarily get from telepathy. Again, we can't rule this out. We can't rule faulty memory. Well, faulty memory, that's pretty far-fetched. I think that can be ruled out. Fraud, we can't rule out. These all have to be kept in mind as we evaluate these cases. In any event, we're left with a remarkable story. If the details as presented are accurate, Amanda's collection of dream reports provide useful information relevant to what researchers call the survival hypothesis. The deceased persons who appear in Amanda's dreams seem motivated to contact the living for benevolent purposes. The deceased soldiers cannot do this directly because their surviving comrade Wink is not a suitable conduit. However, Wink's friend Amanda is an excellent conduit who allows them to convey their positive message quite well. Amanda's decision to share these dreams with a professional researcher rather than a reporter for a tabloid attests to her sincerity and integrity. <coughs> Let us hope. Now, I told you there was a collection of 10 dreams. Why not more? Because after the 10th dream, Wink received orders that he was to be transferred from the United States to South Korea, where he is today. And so that distance has sort of precluded the close association he had with Amanda. So that tenth dream is probably going to be the last one. Amanda continues to have unusual dreams, but none of them that are relevant to the deceased soldiers coming into the dream. So we have a collection of 10 dreams, and I'm getting them all on record so that other investigators can study them, make the most of them, and with Amanda's permission, contact her. So this is still an 
ongoing scenario. Now, I know that our time is uh, almost up for the formal presentation, but I'd like to get back to Eileen Garrett and tell you about how Eileen Garrett was actually the very first participant in our Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn uh, Dream Telepathy series. Before I even became a part of the program, Montague Allman, who I had the dream about, which was presented in that film clip, was trying to establish a way to examine people's dreams and see if they could dream about a picture that was in a sealed envelope. That seemed the simplest way. That's called a target picture. And Eileen Garrett volunteered to become his very, very first participant. So the picture that was used for this very first experiment was what in show business is called a glossy still. The movie Ben-Hur had just come out. The movie was Charlton Heston. And the picture that was used showed the climatic chariot race of the white horses and the black horses racing around the Roman Colosseum. Stephen Boyd with the black horses, Charlton Heston with the white horses. And so Eileen Garrett was at her home trying to focus in on the target picture. And indeed, she uh, was reached, I think, by telephone. And Montague Allman asked her uh, to report her dreams. And she said, had this most unusual dream. It was about a horse race in ancient times, a team of white horses and a team of black horses. You know, very similar, that chariot in the in the uh, Wallace novel, Ben-Hur, which I understand has been made into a movie, which I have to go and see. Well, she nailed it exactly. Now, we never had a correspondence that good in all the 10 years of our actual dream telepathy experiments. Well, there was never anybody like Eileen Garrett. How are us bring that back to these events? Remember that we said that telepathy or clairvoyance would be one explanation? If Amanda had the abilities of an Eileen Garrett, she could have, by telepathy, reached into Wink's past experiences and come up with those specific names. This is only something like an Eileen Garrett person could do. Maybe Amanda is a very gifted medium without realizing it. Well, if so, time will tell, because she's still a fairly young woman, and her career in this area of dreams might take an unusual or unexpected turn that, uh, again, might shed further light upon this particular issue. Now, another thing that's really interesting that comes up is that if you saw the whole series of dreams, the deceased soldiers in one of those dreams say that they're doing quite well and they don't want their loved ones to grieve because they're quite happy on the other side. But the description of the other side that they give is very, very different than you get in the mainstream religions. It's something that uh, causes, shall we say, a lot of influential people in traditional religions and mainstream religions to call all of this demonic or to put it down as being at best fraudulent, at worst demonic uh, in character because these near-death experiences or even after-death experiences don't really match the dogma of their religions. And again, this is something that Eileen Garrett had to cope with all of her life. You can imagine that she was called by uh, very conservative people in the religious field. So these are the references. If any of you want to make a copy of the PowerPoint, you can look up the references that are, uh, that are relevant to this particular article. And this is an expression of gratitude to the Saybrook University Chair for Consciousness Studies, which supported this work. And there you have the slideshow, and there you have the formal end of the lecture. Thank you. Folks, we're right at time at 8 o'clock, so now we have a chance for any questions or discussion. I'm hard of hearing, so you will have to speak loudly, or we will have uh, maybe Shannon do a little translating.
Yes. Hi, Dr. Stan, for Hi. Richard here. Nice yes. to see you again. Um, something that I have been meaning to ask you has to do with your long career. Now, the Mamiades Dream Laboratory was back in the 60s, yes. I believe. Mm -hmm. And now we're in the 2016, and you're working on this, which is also dreams. Yes. Can you tell us how your perception of dreams may have changed or not changed in that long progression? Yeah, sure. Sure. Nice question. Thank you. Well, working with what we call anomalous dreams is only one aspect of my dream work. Every year I go to China to do dream workshops. I'll be going in just a few weeks. And I do three dream, three day workshops in China. And I demonstrate with a volunteer. They come up with a dream. And I demonstrate a fairly simple way of working with the dreams. And then I have them work in pairs or small groups after they see my demonstration. And then they try out the technique on each other. So by the end of the workshop, they have nine different common sense ways of working with dreams. Now, it's uncanny. Last year, my nine volunteers in three different cities, each one of them gave a dream that really related to a real life issue in their daily behavior. And they picked a dream, probably unconsciously, that they knew would help them out if they worked on it. And that dream was sort of a hologram for what was going on in waking life. Now, most of the people that come to my workshops in China are women, and they're women who are of the generation where only one child per family was permitted. And so these are children who survived. Sometimes in those days, the parents had killed off a girl child waiting for a boy child. But these are the girls who were the only children, and so the parents put a lot of resources into these girls, gave them the best education, made them competitive, and so that they would succeed in whatever profession they were in. Maybe psychotherapy, maybe not, maybe business, maybe the arts, maybe something else. And so very few of their dreams really have to do with romantic interests. Their dreams have to deal with their professional development, what's going on in the office, what's going on with their career. And so these dreams are very, very helpful to them in terms of, uh, in terms of something they can really put to use. And the certificate that they get is something that uh, they can use on their resume as sort of a uh, extra notch that will put them above somebody else in terms of competition. So you ask how my attitude on dreams has changed. Whenever I have these experiences in China and elsewhere, it's remarkable how much the dream can tell us about what's going on in daily life. Now, very few of the dreams in China are anomalous in terms of the future or telepathy or anything like that. They're very, very practically here and now oriented. And so, I really gained a great deal of respect for dreams, more than I had originally, in terms of them being the key to our inner life. And I'll tell you one way in which this has had a, had a very practical application. I told you that earlier that I've written two books about PTSD. The third one which comes out this month. It's Working with Dreams and PTSD Nightmares. And this book shows 14 different approaches to dreams from Jungian to existential to cognitive behavioral. And um, each of these then applies that technique to nightmares as a result of post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, I make the case that if you're working with a PTSD patient, you really need to start by working on the nightmare. Because once you get that nightmare to change and shift and work through the system, then the other symptoms of PTSD can be more easily dealt with. And this is also the conclusion of uh, some other experts in this field. Most PTSD therapists ignore nightmares and think they'll go away on their own. No, they won't. The nightmare is deeply embedded in the emotional system of the body. It's processed differently than ordinary nightmares or ordinary dreams. 
But by working with that nightmare and shifting and changing the nightmare, getting that nightmare into symbols and metaphors, can start to unravel the whole PTSD uh, symptomatology. So my attitude on dreams has shifted and changed in terms of seeing them as much more important than uh, I did some decades ago. And now there's research showing that therapists who include dream work in their psychotherapy get better results than therapists who do not. Of course, very few therapists use dreams in their psychotherapy. But those that do have greater side client satisfaction and uh, better outcomes. So I guess that's a little summary statement for you. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Yeah. And when it comes to evidential um, information, has there ever been a study about more uh, evidence coming through in a nightmare or less? Are nightmares more frenetic and less likely to, to produce? Um, actually, that's a very good point. I do not know of any formal study. In my own, ex in my own exper experience, there is very little useful information on nightmares because nightmares, especially PTSD nightmares, are an unsuccessful attempt to process uh, the emotion that still has to be worked through the system. In my point of view, dreams have lasted all of these millennia for four basic reasons. They've been adaptive in human evolution. Number one, dreams help us to remember activities that we've done during the day. Sleep in general, dreams specifically. Yes, they help us remember. We discard things that are not important. We remember things symbolically or literally thanks to dreams. Number two, dreams help us to plan for the future. We sometimes rehearse patterns in the dream that will be useful for us the next few days. Third, dreams are useful for problem solving. Not only creative problem solving, we call it the novels and movies and musical compositions that appeared in dreams, inventions as well, but very practical everyday creativity that's come up in dreams. And fourth, and maybe most important, emotional downloading. There are more unpleasant dreams than pleasant dreams because the emotions are often, in fact usually, downloaded in our dreams and the negative emotions in dreams get processed in the dream so that we can wake up bright and fresh the next day. So unpleasant dreams have a, have a very functional surf purpose. If we don't remember them, all the better. So no, I never had an unpleasant dream in my life. Well, you have, you just haven't remembered it. And so in nightmares, again, keep in mind that some nightmares are the result of some unusual food you've eaten or some unusual place that you're staying which you're not accustomed to. But the run-of-the-mill nightmare is an emotional situation that is not resolved easily. And the repetitive nightmares, it's a valiant attempt of the system to download that emotion, but it just can't. So the nightmare comes over and over again, trying to break through unsuccessfully. And that's why a therapist who knows how to work with nightmares can help get that nightmare through the system. Okay? Other, other questions? Yes? You were talking about some of this, you know, visitation. Oh, sorry. Um, there's a lot of talk now, I mean, today in general about visitation dreams, where people are wondering if it's actual contact of, you know, consciousness outside the body from the other side versus wishful thinking. Have there been any studies that show whether it comes from different parts of the brain or any ways to test if it's a different actual kind of dream? Is it well, you raise a very interesting research possibility. Um, no, it's never been done. I wish somebody would bankroll such a study. Do these anomalous dreams, especially dreams about the deceased, uh, affect the brain differently? Of, of course, that type of study could be done. Brain scanning during dreams is difficult, but it's not impossible. Um, we do know that the post-traumatic stress disorder nightmares are processed differently than ordinary nightmares. There have been studies on that. Why? Because there's money in that. Uh, because of the um, need for military 
uh, veterans to get good psychotherapy and also for um, people, shall we say, in high business positions to function better and get rid of their nightmares. So there's money behind studying that type of uh, nightmare. Um, I think that one, one of the answers that I could give you, I'll give you two answers which are related. When I was working at my monies many, many decades ago, we did an analysis of all of the dreams that were telepathic, in other words, that resembled what a person in another room or another building or another city was, uh, was doing. I mean, Garrett, as I said, was the first one, but over the years we had close to 100 people who spent more than one night, uh, one night or more in our laboratory. And we never were able to do an investigation of their psychophysiological responses, although we had that on the EGs, but we did do an analysis of the content of the telepathic dreams. And we found the telepathic dreams Number one were more colorful, and number two were more emotional. So, if you have a dream that is very colorful, or especially emotional, that is the type of dream that might be anomalous. It might be a dream about the future, it might be a dream about somebody you know. Those are the two uh, salient factors that come up. Also, we found out that the imagery that you have just as you're going to sleep or just as you're coming out of sleep, technically the hypnopontic and hypnagogic imagery is even more prone to telepathy or anomalous effects than dreams are. So those twilight states are especially valuable in terms of unusual uh, correspondences. Okay, now your other question about survival. I. If you go to the Parapsychology Foundation Library on Long Island, you will find entire books written on that topic. And I and Harris Street have actually edited the book just a few years ago called Mysterious Minds, which was the psychophysiology of psychics, mediums, and unusual people. And that that book got very good reviews, and that sort of put together what we have and what we know about the psychophysiology of mediums and the like. But from Brazil, there is a recent experiment that is ignored even by people in parapsychology, which is so far away, but could easily be repeated in the United States. Heidi Garrett was the most famous medium of the 20th century in North America. The most famous medium in South America was. Chico Xavier, a Brazilian spiritist. I never had the pleasure of meeting him. I was almost ready to meet him three times, and then he got sick and couldn't see me. But I know a great deal about him. There's an entire Brazilian film about him. He was not only in contact, supposedly, with the deceased, but they dictated stuff to him. He came out with dozens of books and poems and essays and many of them by different spirit guides. His novels have become bestsellers in Brazil and they've been translated into other languages. There's a movie called Our Place about life after death and what it's like. A big budget Brazilian movie available on DVD. It's an incredible movie. If you want to find out what life after death is, see that movie. It doesn't conform with a lot of Western models because it brings in reincarnation but uh, remarkable film. So anyway, one of Chico Xavier's spirit guides dictated a number of books. And linguists did an analysis of the language used in those books. You know, hundreds of thousands of words. And Chico Xavier, of course, left behind material that he'd written himself, essays and accounts and the like. The two linguistic patterns did not match. From a linguistic point of view, they're written by two different people. Now, if Chico Xavier's unconscious was writing this, well, you'd expect it to follow the same linguistic pattern as ordinary discourse. Unless you want to say, well, it was a subpersonality that wrote those, well, where do subpersonalities come from? Um, 
But that's a remarkable experiment. And again, it could be done with mediums who claim to channel things from another dimension and who have left the written material behind. J.B. Ryan, the founder of modern day parapsychology, was one of the early investigators of Eileen Garrett, as you know. And J.B. Ryan, his wife Louisa E. Ryan, I knew very well when they were alive. And he was originally interested in the survival question, but he figured out he just could not devote his resources to that because he felt there was no way to conclusively demonstrate that this was actually from the spirit world rather than from the person's unconscious. And people are now much more, uh, shall we say, eager to investigate this. So we have a lot of it, very interesting investigations going on in the United States and elsewhere. I would be the last to claim that everything has been definitely demonstrated. All I can say is you can make a case for it. OK, any other questions? Yes? Um, do you subscribe to, when you use the word subconscious, and then you may refer to brain, a very conventional view is that memory is in the brain. But what about views that you know memory is in um, you know, in, our, in our gut, like yeah. our navel. I mean, do, do you do research related to that? Oh, good. That's a wonderful question. I'll tell you why. I think that uh, what we call cognitive neuroscience is too brain oriented. Yeah, it's totally brain oriented. When people talk about the brain, I say, which brain? The brain in the head, the brain in the heart, or the brain in the gut? There are more neurotransmitters in the gut than in the brain. Right. More neurotransmitters in the heart than in the brain. We have three brains. And we get a lot of information from the gut. Intuition, for example, that comes more from the gut than from the brain. So when you talk about the abdominal area as being a brain, absolutely. Absolutely right that this is just now being seriously investigated, finally. Who's doing that research? Um, the pioneer was actually Ken East Purse, who is no longer with us, but now people are doing this uh, in California, the Institute of Heart Math, which is especially interested in mathematics of the heart and intelligence of the heart. Also, you have a variety of European people who are investigating gut uh, neurotransmitters. Yeah, if you just go to Wikipedia and look up gut neurotransmitters, you will find a whole list of studies being done on that. Not enough. This is a new field of investigation, but very important. Like I say, uh, you know, it's so ridiculous, these people that say that you should decapitate a person once they're dying and freeze the head because of all the intelligence of the brain. That makes no sense for anyone. For one thing, because you have so much intelligence in other parts of the body. And your question is a good example of that. Well, thank you for that question. That's a information for all of you that intelligence is spread throughout the body. And the whole body is an information gathering, an information processing system. Yes? Uh, you mentioned in the video uh, earlier about your juice of ayahuasca and how that, that there was a similarity of just the clarity and the colors. Mm -hmm. Um, have you researched any link to that kind of hallucinogenic drug use and uh, un 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 anomalous, anomalous. anomalous. Thank you. Yes. Dreams? Yes. Um, at the end of the month, I'm actually giving a lecture in Palo Alto, California, in Ayahuasca. Um, because I have a long association with Ayahuasca, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, this is a brew or a tea from the Amazon, primarily Brazil and Peru, that induces visionary experiences. And so traditionally it's been used as a religious sacrament. And I have been interested in this ever since my anthropology professor, William McGovern of Northwestern University back in the 19, early 1960s, um, told me about his experiences with ayahuasca. He was in, in the Amazon, I think in Peru, visiting a tribe in his younger days. And the shaman of the tribe took ayahuasca, which was also a yahe, ayahuasca, a variety of other names depending upon the tribe. 
and he saw a funeral procession in a village 500 miles away. The chief had just died. He described the funeral procession in great detail. A few weeks later, McGovern was in that village, found out that everything that was told to him by the shaman checked out that what was actually happening because their chief had died. All the details of the funeral procession were exactly correct. So I remembered that story. Years later, the J.B. Ryan, who I mentioned a few moments ago, was giving a lecture in New York City, and Allen Ginsberg, the famous poet, came up and said, Dr. Ryan, you should look into ayahuasca, into Yahe, because I've had Yahe, and I was able to see the events that are happening hundreds of miles away. Well, you know, J.B. Ryan was in North Carolina, a very conservative state, to bring ayahuasca to into uh, North Carolina in the 1950s, and uh, forget it. But he listened very politely. And I got to know Alan Ginsberg, and I talked with him. And uh, yes, he and William Burroughs and some of their colleagues had all sorts of uh, uh, telepathic contact with ayahuasca when they were in, in South America. And of course, it was not until maybe 15 years ago that I had a chance in Brazil to be in an ayahuasca ceremony. And I've had ayahuasca uh, under its different names, 10 times, always within a religious context. I would not think of taking it alone. I would not think of taking it outside of the spiritual context. And that's a whole other lecture, but I will tell you just one anomalous event that occurred. Uh, one of my students, Chris Ryan, was with me. Chris is now author of a best-selling book called Sex of Dawn. It's the reworking of his doctoral dissertation, Bait Selection and the Pleistocene, and how uh, the way that mates were selected back in the Pleistocene era influenced human evolution, and those roots are still with us, and what the implications of that are for modern coupling, modern marriage, but that's a whole other story. You have to get the lecture, you should read the best-selling book, Sex of God, which is a fancy title for a doctoral dissertation. <laughs> so anyway, Chris was with me in Brazil, in southern Brazil. We were on our way to a Unial de Vegetal meeting. That is one of three ayahuasca religions in Brazil. Unial de Vegetal, Vegetable Union. Santo Daime, Give Me Help, Martini, The Little Boat, three very different uh, sacramental uses of, uh, of ayahuasca, or yahe, whatever you want to call it. So as our little van rode through the rainforest, Chris said, did you see that beautiful woman on the road? No, oh, what beautiful woman? Oh, we passed her now, but she was wearing a green sari. She was Brazilian because she had dark skin, but she had a cast mark on her head. And I had kind of red hair. And I hope she comes to the meeting tonight. She was very beautiful. So we get to the church service, and we go through the kitchen. And there in the kitchen is this beautiful Brazilian woman with a cast mark, red-headed hair, and a long sari, green sari on. How did you get here so quickly? I just saw you on the road. What do you mean? I've been here all evening preparing the food for the service. Well, that was more anomalous than anything that happened once he took ayahuasca. <laughs> so I published that with his permission. That's my favorite ayahuasca ESP experience. <laughs> but uh, yes, I'm actually, um, I can't go myself, but I was invited to a World Ayahuasca Conference, which will be held this fall. And ayahuasca is being seriously investigated by psychologists, psychiatrists, sociologists, other biochemists. It's so interesting because you have to take two jungle plants, uh, Thanasteriasis cape and Gula iridisa, and combine them in just the right amounts because one plant depresses the serotonin so that the other plant can activate the visual centers of the brain and produce these wonderful imageries. Now, how did the Indians know about that hundreds of years ago before the Europeans came? Thousands of plants in the jungle. How did they know which two would produce the visions? And in the right amount, you put in too much of one, too little of the other, you don't have the visions. 
Well, the shamans, I asked that to the shaman, you know, all the plants told us. Simple answer to them. We haven't come up with a better answer. Yeah, so there's a whole marvelous history behind ayahuasca, and I just hope that it is not misused. If ayahuasca hit the streets, it would, as a street drug, be tragic because one of the things that happens during ayahuasca, most people throw up. They get violently ill. You have to get past that. By the time you throw up, it's already affected your brain. And so you have to then enjoy the visions. Can you imagine people throwing up in the middle of the street with ayahuasca and <laughs> So I think it's best off being used in a spiritual context. So that's the short answer, but oh yes, there's all sorts of anomalous experiences that people have during ayahuasca. The Indians report the uh, telepathy, the clairvoyance, the precognition. Uh, a friend of mine, Jeremy Narby, who wrote the marvelous book Cosmic Serpent about shamans who take ayahuasca and they see the DNA helix, the double helix, way before Francis Crick and Watson got their Nobel Prize. The shamans had this double helix. Well, this is the imagery they had when they took ayahuasca. So Jeremy Narby brought down three scientists with unsolved problems, mathematical physics problems. They took ayahuasca under the guidance of a shaman. All three of them got the answer to their problem. He's written about this it's in one of his books. And so, yes, yeah, so ayahuasca can have very practical uses too if the right context is provided. So that's a short answer to your question. Glad you asked it. Okay, other questions? Yes. So you see the relationship between men and Oh, Mr. Mahat, I've got to hear you. Go ahead. Uh, do you see any relations uh, between NDEs and dreams? Between uh, near, near death experiences and dreams. Near death experiences and dreams? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, good question. By the way, there is a whole line of investigation of dreams of people who are dying and many of their dreams when they're dying are very similar to their near-death experiences and so once you go into an altered state and you're in a terminal condition sometimes it's just sheer agony and you're so heavily sedated you really are out if you don't know what's happening but if you have some degree of awareness, you often come back from a near-death experience, a changed person, you no longer fear death, you're resolved but in terms of this life, and you also see a window into a, another life. And this is often reflected in the dreams, but I don't know of any formal study that has really correlated these two experiences. That's another great study for somebody to do in the future. We have anecdotal reports, but no broad-based study. I'm going to mention that to people in the field. I'd love to see that done. Well, I'm familiar with uh, Shikishan. Okay, now just be patient while I no, get a little closer. Okay, try again. No, I'm actually, uh, when you say Shikishan, yeah, I'm busy, so I'm very familiar with uh, Shikishan. Really? So, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always research on my own, and dreams always get interesting. And I, would you take it to the spiritual aspect of it instead of the uh, conventional uh, scientific aspect uh, regarding the similarities or the relationship between both? Because, you know, science cannot explain uh, certain events that happen, especially during near death experience and dreams. And you can relate them if you put it into a spiritual aspect. So it's something that interests me some, uh, at some point. So I don't know well, if, uh, of course you can do this scientifically. I just don't know that even in the stomach you have a lot of room. It's splendid. Well, I, saw, you. I saw I saw you a scientist uh, from Harvard that had an experience and it came out uh, two years ago in the news day. He had a, he was in a coma due to a virus and for like three weeks. The thing is in neuroscience, even though you're in a coma, the brain still has some uh, activity. Mm -hmm. well, in his case, the virus actually completely shut down mm -hmm. his brain, and he still had experience that he could vividly uh, say for two weeks. And that's something that he brought out to the world, and he was the head of neuroscience uh, scientist of Harvard. 
So it wasn't something that you, you could actually uh, not believe in. So he actually conducted studies to prove it and everything. And on my opinion, the only thing that I would connect would be if you see it in spiritual, not in a, like it's not only tele, tele, uh, telepathy, it could be something out of body experience as well. Yeah. Is that a possibility? Yes, that's a possibility. Um, you might look up the work of Bruce Grayson, G R E Y S O N, of the University of Virginia. He is probably the longest researcher in, in the field of near death experiences, and he has done studies of people, yes, flatliners, people who are technically dead and they're still having experiences. Absolutely. And they come back after the flat line disappears, they come back to life, and they report incredible experiences. Their mind has been very active wherever it was, and they're coming up with stories that uh, uh, make a good case that something is surviving bodily death. So he has written dozens of very, very profound articles about near-death experiences, and has made connections <coughs> to some of these other fields like other body experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is all, shall we say, frontier science, and it's now published in respectable journals, whereas 20 years ago we laughed at and scoffed at. And I'll refer you to a book that I co-edited, this Exile Carvanian, Stephen Lynn, The Varieties of Anomalous Experience, which has an entire chapter on each of these experiences, near death out of body, reincarnation even. And this is published by the American Psychological Association, the most conservative psychological group in the country. And they let us publish this book because we approached it all in terms of a scientific framework. And it became one of their best sellers, so a lot of psychologists are reading that book. Now they've come out with an even more radical book by two other friends of mine, Transcendent Mind, to be published in January by Julia Bossridge and Imant Barus, and this even goes further than our book does because it's written, it will be the first text, the first psychology text, which is written by a non, in a non-materialistic framework, mm -hmm. emphasizing all of these things that you've mentioned. So, you know, bit by bit, things are changing a little bit, and many people say, well, science is not really open to these things. Well, maybe 50 years ago it wasn't, but things are slowly and sometimes rapidly beginning to change. But not to say that we can't learn from the humanities, from uh, novels, from first-person experience. There are many sources to knowledge. Science, of course, is be one of them. So we have to keep that in mind as well. Okay, other questions? Oh, way in the back. Okay, we can travel. <laughs> Do you have any um, theories relating to dreams and the phenomena like deja vu? Well, yes, but they're not original. The deja vu experience is the experience that maybe some of you have had about in the middle of an experience, oh, you no, know, I've been here before, I've done this before. And the authority, the leading authority on the Vu experiences is Verna Nepi, N-E-P-P-E, -P -P -E, there's a whole book about these experiences. And there are a number of explanations. It's not just one explanation. First of all, a person's mind might be wandering. You know, this is why mindfulness meditation is coming into psychotherapy. So people keep focused on the here and the now and are mindful as they go through life. And rather let their mind wander. Uh, there is a recent study published in Science, the leading scientific publication in America. People's mind wanders 60% of the time. Less than 40% of the time, they're in the here and the now. What is the activity that keeps them in the here and the now more often than anything else? Sexual activity. <laughs> yeah, that keeps people in the here and the now better than anything else. So, you never thought of sexual activity as being a form of meditation? Yes, absolutely. It keeps people mindful of the moment, the here and the now, absolutely. So. 
people's mind wanders, they come back, oh, I've been here before. Of course you've been here before, three seconds ago, before the mind wanders. <laughs> okay, another reason for deja vu experiences is, and J.B. Ryan took this idea forward, that a person has a precognitive dream, and in the dream, they dream about what's going to happen the next day. And so when it actually happens, oh, I've been here before. Yes, you were there before in your dream. So, another explanation, it can be a little neurological glitch in your attention. A lot of people have very, very minor episodes that we would call epileptic, but they don't notice it because it's such a minor little glitch. And sometimes a person has a little minor epileptic seizure, and then they come back and, oh, I've been here before. Yes, you were before, before this little seizure. Nepi is a neurologist, and so he tries to put things in a neurological framework. Yeah, so there's, there's been some very good work on deja vu experiences, and they are real, and there can be very common sense explanations for them, and also some more exotic explanations, like J.B. Ryan's precognitive dream explanation. Okay, our time is almost up, folks. Do you have time for one more question? We have one more question. Okay, be patient, I'll come back and hear you. Um, yeah. When you talk about the dreams, the case studies, you said that the afterlife was not that, like, at all very traditional. Right. But you didn't really tell us what the afterlife was like in those dreams. Did you say that? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I've read a lot of these accounts, and the <coughs> most interesting thing that comes forth is that people claim that they're continuing their development in the afterlife. Sometimes that requires them to come back and reincarnate. Sometimes it involves them going into a different level of consciousness. Sometimes they, and again, this is all in the reports, there's a literature on this, they have conversations with friends from this life, they have conversations with people they've already wanted to meet, but the afterlife psyche is not stationary. As I say, it can come back and reincarnate, or it can go into the eternal bliss because the sense of self, depending upon which philosophical position you want to take, can be very, very fluid. It can sometimes it isn't stable. It dissipates and then it reintegrates again. It goes off and then it comes back. And sometimes it comes back as another person, another life. So there's a lot that we simply do not know about the afterlife if it exists, but the reports that come back from the people who have near-death experiences with the people who allegedly speak through mediums are very different than what you get in the uh, mainstream religions. Thank heavens. You don't have punishment, you don't have hell, you don't have damnation, you have more evolution. You have forgiveness, you have more raising of consciousness, and that's a good hopeful note to end on. Thank you. <laughs>